All right. So um, as Jimin mentioned, I'm a retired psychiatrist and I previously used to work in a general hospital department. Uh, and so that most of my work was dealing with uh, anxiety and mood disorders as part of uh, general hospital. And I also did multidisciplinary rounds with a hospice once a week. So um, I think there are many things one could talk about regarding mental health in the field of Blue 3, and a lot of things have come up in our meetings. Uh, there's the imposter syndrome, there's the double itched sword of perfectionism, or maybe it's the Luthian knife double itch uh, in our case. There's that link with bipolar disorder and creativity. There's the isolation and the real stress for um, regarding financial stability. So for this talk, we are really just going to uh, only talk about this one thing because uh, we can't talk about everything. And we, so in this case, we we're going to talk about uh, just mental health issues pertaining to being in a male dominated field. Okay. How do I move my slides? Ah, okay. <laughs> so um, I will be starting, first of all, with a sort of review uh, of existing research on mental health in a male-dominated field. And then after that, I'm going to be moving on to talking a little bit uh, about understanding the stress response and managing the stress response. And this is uh, in relation to uh, one of the pieces of research that we'll be looking at. Okay, so um, the first review of research, uh, one of the first rather useful articles that came up uh, is a review article in the Journal of Business in 2020. And uh, that was written by Robin, Robin Pickering, and it's a very comprehensive summary, uh, which is why I chose it. And uh, unfortunately, it also kind of reads somewhat like a horror story. And so I initially wrote this whole slide with the, everything on it and looked so terrible that I took it all off and just put a picture there. And I'll just read out some of what was in the summary instead. Uh, so, uh, what's, uh, so these are some of the research papers that one can find with regards to working in a male dominated field. Uh, women experienced sexism and those that did experience that had higher levels of stress, more missed days of work, higher rates of working when unwell and lower levels of productivity. They were also more likely to be assigned informal responsibilities such as being the office housekeeper or being the caring mother to a colleague. There were Overt written policies that affected women more, such as a restrictive family leave policy. There were also covert uh, expectations, and this would include uh, adherence to traditional gender roles in terms of demeanor and dressing. And this actually occurred in medical school. When I was in medical school, we had to wear skirts for some departments. It's much better now somehow. Um, the Peel Research Center report states that 62% of women working in male-dominated industries in the U.S. reported sexual harassment, and this is in comparison with 46% uh, working in female-dominated industries. And the U.S. General Social Survey data analysis shows that women who have uh, gender and age-related mistreatment at work were more likely to miss work and report more days of poor mental health, and those that had experienced sexual harassment reported even worse mental health. And in STEM and other male-dominated fields, women do not get promoted at the same rates as men, and they suffer significantly higher rates of attrition. And finally, from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, women only hold 20% of leadership roles in the tech workforce. Right, lovely. So we'll come to the next study. And the next study that comes up uh, is the one that we'll talk more about later as well. And this is a really interesting study. Uh, it was done by uh, Kate Taylor uh, from the University of uh, Indiana University of Bloomington. And um, so this study basically states that women in male dominated jobs have more stress. 
and we'll get to the details of this study in the next slide. Um, so basically, um, this is a really interesting study where they studied the fluctuation pattern of cortisol, which is a stress hormone in women. And uh, this was a significantly large study. There were 40, uh, 400 and, uh, 440 women in jobs where 85% of the workforce were men. And this uh, figure is taken based on previous studies that precede this, uh, such as the ones by Cantor in the 1990s, where he developed this term called tokenism, where uh, the, when the, the pr proportion of the workforce uh, gets so low that are women, uh, it's kind of like called token women. And that's where the word comes from. Um, so if 85% of the workforce were men, they analyzed the daily cortisol levels in these women. And cortisol is a really useful marker because it reacts to social stresses and not just not so much to a kind of acute physical stress and uh, hence it's a valuable biomarker. And what were the results, which we'll see in a minute. So the findings, women in male dominated occupations had dysregulated patterns of cortisol throughout the day compared to women in workplaces with an even gender split. And I looked at the numbers and it's a, a very compelling study with a very nice uh, biostats. Um, so this is in keeping with previous research that has shown uh, higher stress in women in male dominated occupations. But this is the first research to demonstrate that this stress is actually expressed physically in the form of uh, dysregulated cortisol levels. Okay. Now the reason why cortisol, uh, uh, and in addition to cortisol, they also examined other uh, sort of secondary factors as you would call them. And uh, these included uh, that uh, women were more likely to experience social isolation, sexual harassment, low levels of support, and had a higher time moving up in the company, and also perceived that co-workers doubted their competence. Unfortunately, it might sound quite familiar. Okay, next. Um, so that study we're going to return to later, uh, because uh, this finding of dysregulated cortisol is highly, highly significant and has uh, implications for both mental and physical health. So it's a very important concept to think about. Right, these, uh, I'm just gonna move on to a few more studies that I found. This is a study done in Germany, um, a labor research journal 2014. This examined the risk of depressive symptoms in women working in male dominated fields, as well as males working in female dominated fields. So in this study, also quite clear results, they had higher mean values of depressive symptoms in females compared to females in female dominated fields. And this reached highly significant difference levels biostatistically. And for this study, no relationship was found in men and depressive symptoms working in female dominated fields. Although there are some other studies that uh, don't uh, support this particular finding. Right, next study we'll come to is, uh, this one's one of my favorites. So this one, uh, 204. Uh, so this in this study, 48 undergraduates read fictional biographical material concerning three fictional employees at an aircraft engineering company. So this field is, has been characterized as typically male. And half the students were randomized to read the employee was female and the other half were randomized to the vice versa. And they were to rate totally subjective things like competence, likability, and apply descriptive adjectives such as being abrasive or accommodating or pushy. And what were the results? The result was that if the male was rated competent and the uh, if the person's okay, if the person's performance was ambiguous on the description, but uh, 
but the person was thought to be male, then the male was rated competent, the female was rated as floundering, but both were rated as likable. Now, if the bio stated high performance for the female, then the female is rated competent, but low on likability with associated negative adjectives like pushy, selfish, and manipulative. And if the bio stated high performance for the male, then the male was rated competent and also high on likability. So it's like, ah, sigh, right. Okay, next, uh, next one is, uh, and this, uh, this study is uh, 2019. It's an, as a retrospective study uh, on aluminum workers. So they already had a data set and they took this data set and they examined uh, how many depression related outpatient visits were noted when the workforce uh, comprise only 20 to 30 percent women and um, what they noted was that if the workforce had at least 20 to 30 percent women there were actually significantly fewer depression related outpatient visits and this was observed in both male and female workers so if your workforce had at least you know some women uh, this seemed to to be protective against depression in this retrospective cohort right now um, we'll come to a, so all those previous studies mainly talked about a female workers in a male dominated field right and it is a little quite horrifying like i said so now we have a few slides on uh, what studies I could find on the mental health in men in male-dominated fields. And these fields included construction, mining, uh, manufacturing, uh, shipyards, as well as emergency services. Uh, this picture happens to be a picture of um, our Keppel Harbour with the Keppel Shipyard. And this is Dock 1, one of the oldest docks in Singapore, which makes Singapore, Singapore. Uh, is the fact that we are located in a shipping street and we have a harbour. And uh, this dock was built in 1859. And uh, this picture was probably taken in the 70s when my late father was working at Keppel Shipyard. And uh, in 1913, we built another dock, which was called the King's Dock. And that was the second largest in the world at that time. Uh, okay, brief digression. So uh, next is... Um, so we're talking about mental health of men in such fields, including shipyards. Uh, the first study is a systematic review of depression uh, in male-dominated industries by Roach. And um, this, uh, the, the, the review was a very big review. Uh, they, they reviewed thousands of studies and the method, met methodology was quite thorough. Um, they excluded emergency services. And in, eventually, uh, the good thing about that was that 10 countries were included uh, in the end, and a wide range of industries. Okay. And what did that find? That one found a definite elevated prevalence of depression, found across the spectrum of industries, where of male-dominated industries. There were subgroups within the industries that had even higher risk profiles, extremely high levels and prevalence of depression. Uh, even after controlling for confounding factors such as psychosocial factors, we, uh, there was uh, still an increase in prevalence that could be accounted for uh, due to being in a male-dominated industry. The factors track Exam uh, influencing the prevalence of depression were then examined. And um, these actually read quite similarly to the ones in females, work hours, uh, physical activity, income, time pressure, the demands of the job, role conflicts, uh, effort reward imbalance, emotional demands, exposure to violence, social support and job status. Now, other than this big study, um, there are at least uh, 10 studies that I could find, and they all uh, indicated an elevated risk of mental health problems in males uh, 
working in male-dominated industries. Uh, these include elevated rates of suicide, uh, increased risk of injuries and fatalities, uh, increased risk of mental health problems. Uh, there are some studies that look into the endorsement of uh, masculine norms, which are associated with poor health outcomes. This includes smoking, excessive drinking, refusing to wear seat belts, and avoidance of uh, both physical and mental health care services. So generally, most studies uh, demonstrate that men uh, in male-dominated environments report worse health than men in mixed gender environments. So as you can see, and this is what I always find, it's people have more in common than we think. It seems to be bad for both genders to be in an environment that lacks, um, uh, that has a dominance of either males or females. Okay. Uh, now we're coming to the middle part of my talk which is understanding the stress response. And um, the reason why we're gonna talk about this is because uh, this, uh, the, this, the Bloomington study by Taylor um, demonstrates uh, dysregulated cortisol profiles. And uh, this uh, understanding this stress response uh, can help us to mitigate the stress response within us and um, hopefully then mitigate the, the, the physical and mental disorders that can result from a stress response. Right, so um, usually when we talk about understanding a stress response, uh, we need to think of it in terms of this being uh, understanding that uh, our brains possess uh, a response to danger that is kind of primordial and evolutionary, kind of like in, it's been around since caveman days and therefore we are all alive now and our genetic material passed on to the, the next generation, so to speak. Uh, this is also commonly referred to as the fight or flight response. And um, how I usually explain it to um, patients previously is that our brains are very clever, but not very clever at the same time. Um, so basically, uh, when our brains are faced with danger, so like, you know, ah, there's the woolly mammoth is running to you. So something, uh, a series of events happen in our brain. So our eyes and our ears will process data and that gets passed on to the amygdala, which is that funny thing at the bottom. And then um, the amygdala on perceiving danger will send a distress signal to the hypothalamus. And that in turn will send uh, messengers via the autonomic nerves to the adrenal glands, which is kind of like above your kidneys. And the immediate effect of that is to pump adrenaline into your system. And the effect of adrenaline acts uh, on, on many parts of our body. And to know uh, what parts of the body it acts on is quite simple. It just You can just try to imagine that there's a woolly mammoth running toward you, or maybe you're crossing the road and a bus is bearing down on you and you had to jump out of the way. And how you feel at that moment is the effect of adrenaline. So your heart is pumping, your blood pressure is up, your pupils have dilated, you've got increased blood sugar in your system, and the blood has been pumped away from your gut, uh, your brain, and it's going to your muscles so that you can run away from the imminent danger. Okay, now... Um, the problem with the stress response in the modern age is that uh, it can become easily maladaptive because now in the urban modern world, our stress is no longer the woolly mammoth running to us. It's a low level kind of like chronic grinding stress, you know, of, of the, the strange person in your workplace or you know, some, the, the, the interpersonal stress and the financial stress. So what happens when that that, that, that stress continues in your brain is still perceiving stress. After that initial, initial search of adrenaline, we have a second system, which is called the um, HPA axis. The hypothalamopituitary adrenal axis. So that's a, like a secondary system. Basically, what that does is that it's a series of hormonal signals uh, 
that keeps um, keeps the our sympathetic nervous system switched on. It's like, like keeping your foot on the accelerator pedal because the stress is continuing. So after the initial ad adrenaline, this has to kick in. And so things get released in a series and it also goes to the adrenal, uh, the adrenal glands. But in this case, uh, instead of adrenaline, cortisol is being released. And cortis that's why cortisol is a very, very good biomarker of stress. Now, uh, next slide. So there's cortisol exists in our body uh, in a natural state. And normally it fluctuates in what we call a normal diurnal flu uh, cortisol fluctuation. So uh, normally if you just took your cortisol for no good reason uh, throughout the day, you would find that it's, um, it peaks right about where you're waking up in the day. And then it kind of slowly drops down to a nadir point at 12 midnight usually, which is why it's not good to give talks at midnight. And then it slowly rises up to a peak again as you're sleeping and until it's about time to wake up. And that's called a normal diurnal variation. And the first sign that you are under stress is that you've lost that variation. It just all goes high and it stays high more or less the whole day. Okay, so now, um, uh, next slide, yeah, and so the effects of that is uh, actually what the effects of chronic stress is, yeah, the effect of having a high cortisol, which we sometimes can get uh, artificially, like for example, if someone is taking a cortisol like preparation for whatever reason, and we do get these same effects, uh, so if you have a risk of high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, uh, increased body fat, uh, their risk of diabetes is increased, uh, obesity, osteoporosis, migraines, uh, uh, musculoskeletal uh, symptoms, chronic pain, and as well as gastrointestinal disorders, peptic ulcers, that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of mental health, uh, it's been related to anxiety and depressive disorders, substance abuse, uh, sleep disorders, pain disorders, and impaired cognition. So it is important to manage this uh, response. Now, how we can, how this understanding helps us to manage this response is uh, through several targets from uh, knowing that this is the response. The first target we can target is uh, what I call cognitive techniques. So knowing that our stress response is primitive and just happens that way uh, will help us use cognitive techniques to target that. So if we understand that this is normal physiology, it evolves for physical survival, and that this cascade occurs faster than conscious thought. So then we can stop treating anxiety as something weak, you know, or uh, uh, something that should not be happening. And uh, or a lot of patients used to say, am I going crazy? You know, oh, no. So it's not, you're not going crazy. It's a normal uh, effect that's happening in our brains and it's uh, evolved for our survival actually. So understanding this, we can step back as more like an observer whenever we get anxiety responses mm -hmm. and we can use this information more objectively. Sometimes I tell people that uh, we can use anxiety like the amber light. I don't know if you guys have amber lights <laughs> in your traffic lights, <laughs> but yeah, we, we have them. So it goes from, uh, for, so ours goes from red. Um, it goes from, uh, also, so if you have a green traffic light, it goes amber before it goes red. That's how it happens in Singapore. And then, but then it goes, ours goes straight back to green, whereas in some countries from red, it goes to amber again before it goes to green. So I always tell the people here that we can use anxiety like an amber light. It is there to tell us that something is happening. It's warning us that something is up. So like the amber light is there. It means that you have to do something. You either have to speed up or you have to slow down, right? But you have to do something about it. And, and so we can do, do the same thing. Uh, we are anxious, maybe because the cup is about to fall, so we can do something about it. If we can't do something about it, we are too far away, then we could do something cognitive, like 
come to terms and say, okay, it's going to fall, I'll accept that. But you know, whatever it is, we're gonna do something about it. So so three minutes warning for, for Wai Young, there's three minutes left. So that's cognitive techniques. So uh, similar to that is the stress, the hypothetical stress response curve, which we can also use that to manage our anxiety. So hypothetically, anxiety can be good. It can increase our performance up to a point where it's kind of not working anymore. We get too fatigued and we start breaking down. So the idea is to keep ourselves in the correct zone of this hypothetical stress response curve. Kind of like use the good stuff, but don't get into the bad bits. Okay, next. And uh, the last way to modulate a stress response, so we've done cognitive, uh, and is to, uh, is to use a biofeedback mechanism to trick our body into turning off this cortisol gas pedal. And some of the things you already do, and that's actually what's, what's happening. So when we do things like physical activity or yoga, tai chi, any martial art form, anything that does involves deep breathing exercises, we are actually trying to reset this, this whole anxiety thing going on uh, and the cascade. Uh, and of course, uh, not forgetting social interventions such as accepting help and uh, looking for social support like women in the three. Okay, last slide, I do believe. And uh, what else can we do in terms of workplace? Uh, this has to do with um, what we are talking about, male dominated workplaces. Think about things like flexible working hours. Uh, accommodating space and time for breastfeeding, uh, ensure that policies include family leave, engage in training and implicit bias, remind people that research repeatedly demonstrates that workforce diversity positively impacts on your revenue, your profits, your workplace satisfaction, your customer base and your market value. And I think importantly, we need to make sure that uh, young women and girls have female role models in that industry. That's all, the end. Oh yeah, and that's basically a summary of what I was just saying, which is basically that, yeah, we have evidence that all these work environments mess up people and we need to recognize and manage, recognize the environment, manage our stress patterns and then increase support systems in our industry. Yay, thank you. Thank you, Ayong. That was, I learned so much. That was really helpful. Um, and uh, we unfortunately have run out of time for a QA. Um, but I hopefully, you know, with the continued seasonal um, mental health check ins at Women in the Three community, and um, we're, uh, I, I feel super lucky to have Ayong with us. Like, <laughs> she's they're usually the one that like jumps in and be like okay let's think about this <laughs> and i'm like okay take a deep breath and just calm down let's um deep breath and sing happy birthday to i am yeah oh ah. you <laughs> what today's your birthday oh my gosh yeah okay. well it's it was yesterday but yeah <laughs> happy birthday now that it's midnight, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your birthday with us um, and your experience and knowledge and all these encouragement um, and your presence in Thank the you. in the community.